Well, thank you very much, Lawrence. Uh, Your Excellency, Ambassador Liu, ladies and gentlemen, uh, on behalf of the University of Cambridge and the Marshall Society, it's a great pleasure for me to welcome the Ambassador and his colleagues uh, to Cambridge. Uh, the Vice, vice Chancellor is at the World Economic Forum in Davos today, so he sends his apologies. Uh, both he and Pro Vice Chancellor Jennifer Barnes, who is responsible for our international relationships, have very warm memories of the previous visit of Ambassador Liu uh, and Madame Hu, uh, made here in February 2011, and they send, they send you their best wishes and their apologies that they can't be with you today. There are frequent visits uh, by senior Cambridge figures to China, uh, and we frequently welcome our colleagues from China, building research links and building mutual trust. Uh, and indeed, my wife and I are visiting China uh, for three weeks later this year, and we're greatly looking forward to, our, to returning there uh, after, because uh, we have very warm memories of our visit there last time. <clears throat> Ambassador Liu studied at Dalian University of Foreign Languages, majoring in English, and he also studied at Tufts University in the USA, obtaining a master's degree in international relations. He joined the Chinese Foreign Service in 1974, and he's had an outstandingly successful career. He served extensively in the USA before his appointment as ambassador in Egypt and then in the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. And he's been here as the ambassador in the UK since 2009. Today's conference on development promises to be excellent and, and uh, I congratulate the society on, on putting together such uh, an exciting program. And I'm very delighted that the first important contribution will be from Ambassador Liu. We're all looking forward to hearing his talk, which is entitled, China Has a Bright Future in the Road Ahead. Ambassador. Pro Vice Chancellor, Professor Jeremy Sanders, ladies and gentlemen, students, faculty, members of Cambridge University, it is a real pleasure for me to come back to Cambridge University. Professor Sanders mentioned my first visit in 2011. In fact, after that, I made another visit. I came here to donate books to Needham Institute of the university on behalf of the Chinese Embassy, the Ministry of Culture. And in fact, this is my third visit. Cambridge happened to be the only university that I visited three times since I became Chinese ambassador about four years ago. Why? Why Cambridge so attractive to me? Because this is a place which has produced a galaxy of luminaries in so many disciplines. If a person is a math mathematician, a historian, politician, philosopher, how should we address such a being? How to describe one who is highly accomplished in so many fields, so many areas? I think the answer probably should be an economist. I don't know if you agree with me or not. I know Professor Saunders is a chemist. Sir Afri Marshall was a, such a great economist. Today we, tra we pay tribute to the immense legacy he has left. He's a founder of the Cambridge School. It is therefore a deep honor for me to speak at his eponymous institute, society that bears his name. The theme of today's discussion is the road ahead, visions for emerging world and poverty. In any discussion today about emerging world and economies, a growing consensus is China is the bellwether the rationale is that China is by far the largest emerging economy. 
And so far, China has been the most successful and stable emerging economy. Moreover, in the terms of a poverty reduction, China has, without question, made extraordinary historical contribution to global poverty reduction. This achievement is not just a Chinese view. This is from Economist newspaper in June 2013. I quote, China pulled six, what, 660 million people out of misery between 1981 and 2010, reduced its extreme poverty rate from 84% in 1980 to 10% now, I unquote. Since reform and opening up in the late 1970s, the Chinese government has carried out a massive poverty reduction program. The aim is to ensure food and clothing for the rural poor. As a result, the Chinese rural population in absolute poverty plummeted from 250 million to 32 million. This is a cut of 87%. China was the first country to meet the UN Millennium Development Goal of halving the poorer population. The Director General of the UN Food and Agriculture Organization commented that China's efforts are the largest contributing factor to global poverty reduction and hunger reduction. The UN Development Program concluded that without China's achievements, worldwide poverty reduction would have fallen back. Over the years, China has drawn useful experiences from its poverty reduction endeavors. First, economic growth is the prerequisite. In the past three decades, since the reform and opening up, China's GDP has maintained an annual average growth of 9.8%. China's GDP per capita surged by 16 times on the basis of 1978 level. A thriving economy has created many jobs and increased incomes of tens of millions of farmer-turned-workers. In addition, a flourishing economy has secured funding resources for poverty reduction programs. An impressive input from government has driven such programs. For example, social benefits like minimum living allowances, medical care, and five guarantees for rural vulnerable. These five guarantees are food, clothing, medical care, housing, burial expenses for the aged, the infirm, widows, and orphans. Second, the Chinese government has recognized that a backstop for poverty reduction is a balanced regional development. For geographical and historical reasons, the majority of Chinese poor population are in Western provinces. In 2000, China launched a huge program to develop Western provinces and regions. The record shows that for over a decade, more than 40% of transfer payment from the central government has been spent on Western provinces. This has strongly boosted the development of China's Western provinces. I worked as assistant governor for two years in Gansu, one of the China's pro poorest provinces. There I personally witnessed the generous support for Gansu from the central government and affluent Eastern provinces. Last December, I accompanied Prime Minister Cameron on his visit to the city of Chengdu in China's Sichuan province, that is also one of the China's western provinces. There too, I saw the speed and scale of the development in China's western part. The regional gap between China's west and east is narrowing quickly. 
The third principle of China's government for poverty reduction is that the poor region's own development capacity is the key. As an old Chinese saying goes, give a man a fish, you feed him for a day. Teach a man to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. In those poor regions, China has taken measures to improve basic production conditions. In addition, efforts are made to increase capacity for self-development, village by village. For people living in places with extremely harsh national conditions, the Chinese government encouraged them to move to more hospital areas. In turn, their basic living and production conditions are fundamentally changed for the better. On top of these policies, China has optimized regional economic structure and increased income through programs like microcredit, vocational training, and development of local speciality industries. China takes very seriously its responsibilities as a large member of international community. While reducing its own poverty, China has taken an active part in fighting poverty worldwide. Since the beginning of this century, China has provided assistance to more than 120 countries, 120 developing countries, under a framework of South-South cooperation. China does this to the best of its capabilities and has, has come a long way to improve self-development capacity of these countries. Chinese contributions include building infrastructure, industrial and agricultural production projects, providing materials and assistance, sending experts, experts for technical cooperation, contributing medical teams and volunteers, offering emergency humanitarian relief, and providing human resources training. In the final analysis, poverty reduction is a matter of development. Ms. Deng Xiaoping, the chief architect of China's reform opening up policies, said, development is of arch Development is of overarching importance. China has made exceptional program during the past three decades. China now is the world's second, second largest economy and also the largest trading nation. But with a population of 1.3 billion, development remains a daunting task for China now and in the future. There have been many discussions and forecasts about China's future development. Some are optimistic, others are pessimistic. Recently, I've noticed some frequently used terms in these discussions. They reflect close attention. The world is paying to China's future development. I want to share with you my thoughts on China's development by citing some of these frequently used terms. The first one is a Lewis turning point. This concept comes from Sir Arthur Lewis, who was a Nobel Prize laureate in economics. He's the best remembered for his theory that in the process of development, there will be a point at which excess labor in subsistence sector is fully absorbed into modern sector. At that point, further capital accumulation begins to increase wages. This is called Lewis turning point. Not long ago, a shortage of labor was reported in some cities of China. Some believe this symbolized the arrival of this Lewis point, turning point for China's economy. These analysts conclude that this is where 
China turns from an economy of excess labor supply to one of a labor shortage. Indeed, thinking behind the lowest turning point is taken very seriously in China. It has prompted China to speed up economic transformation and upgrading. The aim for China is to achieve sustainable development. China's demographic dividends will not do them. Instead, it will, further, it will be further released through reform. The reasons are as follows. First, China has no labor shortage now and will not have for a long time to come. The so-called Chinese labor shortage was only a temporary phenomenon. The third plenum of the 18th CPC Central Committee late last year set out a series of measures of reform. This include quickening, urbanizing, quickening urbanization, especially expediting the reform of a household registra registration system, lifting restrictions on mobility between towns, small cities, and medium cities, and extending urban housing benefits and social safety. A reading of point zero, zero point 0.4 is internationally recognized as a warning for dangerous levels of inequality. In recent decades, China's Gini index has been between 0 0.47 and 0 0.49. This has underlined the pressing need to reform income distribution. China recognizes the dangers that can emerge from so big a gap between the rich and the poor. In recent years, China has taken a number of measures to address this issue. For example, raising minimum wage levels and pension standards, adjust income tax rate and the threshold, increase transfer payment to low income earners, and scaling up support for agriculture, farmers, and rural areas. These measures have paid off. Going forward, will take into full consideration China's realities. That will mean striking a balance between market and efficiency, and between development and distribution. China will grow its economy so that there will be more to share. China will imp improve income distribution so that increased economic benefits will be shared as widely as possible. To this end, the third plenum has laid out the following measures. Protect income for honest work and raise the ratio of work pay in primary distribution. Improve mechanism for advancing pay increase. Upgrade redistribution tools such as taxation, social security, and transfer payments. Enlarge middle income class. Close the income gap between urban and rural areas, between regions and between sectors. Form an olive-shaped income pattern. At the same time, China view anti-corruption measures as an important means to increase income equality. Cracking down on corruption will stem grow green income from bribes, embezzlement, and abuse of power. This will prevent rent seeking and promote social equity and justice. The third term I wish to cite is the PM 2.5 density. Particular matter or PM are tiny pieces of solid or liquid matter associated with the Earth's atmosphere. PM 2.5 refers to fine articles with a diameter of 2.5 micrometers or less. 
Now PM 2.5 has become a household name in China. This is due to frequent occurrences of heavy smog across China. Though a meteorological term, PM 2.5 has become a severe test for China's economy. So how to cut PM 2.5 density? This mirrors a country's approach to economic development. It raises a question whether China should achieve GDP growth at a huge environmental or human cost. China's answer is clearly no. An important aspect of China's endeavor to transform its economic growth model is to tighten measures of environmental protection. China should not single-mindedly pursue the gold mountain in economy. China should preserve and nurture green mountains in the nature. Conservation of eco-environment is an important part in the five-in-one reform master plan drawn up by the third planner. This blueprint states that China will enforce a strictest regulation of environmental protection, damage compensation, accountability, and punishment. China will also improve its system of environmental management and ecological restoration. Severe environmental damage will be punished by criminal law. Recently, China has adopted measures to conserve energy and cut emission. This includes closing down large numbers of energy in density business, enforce vehicle restriction and emission rules, use environmental protection as one of the criteria for assessing performance of local officials, cancel mandatory GDP growth targets for natural conservation areas or ecologically fragile regions, and audit natural resources one local official leaves his post. London used to be known as the city of fog. Today it has successfully shaken off that famous image. I'm confident that likewise, China can return to its people, clear blue skies, through the shift of China's growth model and with comprehensive measures of pollution control and treatment. The fourth term I will cite today is the so-called middle income trap. A 2007 World Bank report makes the following statement. After an emerging market economy rises above poverty trap marked by per capita GDP of 1,000 US dollars or less, it will quickly arrive at economic takeoff. Economic takeoff means a per capita GDP between 1,000 and 3,000 US dollars. However, a per capita GDP 3,000 US dollars is a high risk area. At this level, social tensions caused by fast economic growth have been shown to have the potential to explode. Then economic growth is blocked by social upheavals. Many developing countries are marooned into this middle -come income trap, plagued by economic stagnation, crisis, and social turmoil. The lessons must be learned. China has studied the cases of many countries and have drawn their lessons. China's conclusion is that to avoid middle income trap, China must keep the growth engine running. The objective is achieved through the following. First, China will comprehensively deepen reform. Reform is the most powerful driving force for China's development. The third plan of 2013 is the manifesto, an action plan for China's second round of reform. 
The first round of reform emerged from the comparable third plenum in 1978 that gave birth to reform and opening up policies. The 2013 third plenum asserted that market forces should play a decisive role in resources allocation. This is a major theoretical breakthrough. This is also a kernel of China's economic reform. Following these principles, China will strengthen top-down design while continuing to cross the river by filling the stones. We'll try, both, we'll try to achieve both general progress and make advances in key areas. Second, China will promote economic transformation and upgrading, greatly encourage innovation, expand domestic demand. The Chinese economy is shifting from reliance on factors of production to innovation. Through scientific innovation, we aim to reduce energy and resources consumption, as well as lower environmental costs. We aim to achieve parallel progress in industrialization, informationization, urbanization, and agricultural modernization. In terms of domestic demand, the Financial Times forecast for 2014 about China are very upbeat, predicting a growth of over 7%. The main reason is it believes that consumption in China will continue to grow. Third, China will probably, will probably handle social problems like income distribution, population aging, and social welfare. China will break fetters of vested interest, allow the mass population to share the fruits of development, and ensure continued economic growth. Last, but not the least, I want to say a few words about Thucydides' trap. You may wonder why. This is not an economic term, but a term of international politics. 2,500 years ago, the Greek historian Thucydides wrote of the war between Athens and Sparta like this. It was the rise of Athens and the fear that this inspired in Sparta that make the war in inevitable. A generalization of this argument is an emerging power is bound to challenge an established power. The latter, without exception, reacts to the challenge. Hence, war is inevitable. This is a doomed scenario of a power politics. With China growing to become the world's second largest economy, this is a popular prediction. However, history is not science. There's no law in history. The purpose of recording history is to warn later generations from repeating previous mistakes. In the past 100 years, there have been two tragic world wars. They occurred in the age with a limit global interdependence. Now we are in an era when countries have become interdependent as never seen before. That means conflict and war is no longer the only way to obtain resources and markets. Without peace, there will be no development. China is committed to a path of peaceful development. China's foreign policy is crafted to serve its development at home by creating and enabling an external environment. At the same time, China will maintain and promote world peace and prosperity through its own peaceful development. China will not follow the footsteps of some countries in the past. China is dedicated to realizing China's dream of national rejuvenation. The Chinese dream is in line with the world's dream. China hopes the Chinese dream will come true together with American dream, European dream, and African dream. I assure you of China's 
magnanimity. In recent years, China has initiated and further developed the concept of new power relations. This new type of relation between big countries are defined by a partnership of mutual respect and a mutual benefit. This is not only necessary for China-US relations. It is also inspiration for China's relations with other countries. To be specific, such relation features non-conflict, non-confrontation. It requires the following principles. Reasonably view each other's strategic intentions. Properly handle differences through dialogue and cooperation. Respect each other's choice of social system and development path. Respect each other's core interests and main concerns. Discard a zero-sum game mindset. Accommodate others' interests while pursuing one's own and promote common development while achieving one's own. I believe our world is big enough for China and United States to grow together and big enough for all countries to prosper together. Ladies and gentlemen, through one turning point and the two indices and the two traps, I have in fact laid out China's measures and visions for future development. It, this covers China's economic, social, environmental, and foreign policies. I hope that my introduction will offer you some respect, some prospect to study and comprehend China's future trajectory. Ladies and gentlemen, Sir Afro Marshall held a personal credo. He said, a simple explanation for the very fact of being simple is certainly wrong. China's development is an endeavor never seen in human history, both by scale, speed, and by complexity. There will be no simple solution. There will be no simple answer. It will not be a plain sailing. However, 1.3 billion Chinese people have the courage and confidence to surmount all difficulties and challenges on our way forward. The people of China are confident that going forward, they will make another wonder with the Chinese economy. The Chinese people will fulfill their national dream of the national revitalization in the road ahead. In turn, that advance will make even greater contribution to global growth and prosperity. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency. We, can, we now have a few minutes. Um, the Ambassador has, has kindly agreed to answer questions. So if you have a question, please can you put your hand up and someone will come and bring you a microphone. Thank you, Ambassador Liu, for your very illuminating talk. Mm -hmm. My name is Guy Naramit, and I would like to ask you a question about China's encouragement of urbanization um, and the possible reform of the hukou system, which there could be three potential problems. The first is um, the property prices in China in urban areas are already quite high, I believe. And um, how would the Chinese government prevent the problem of property bubbles? The second problem is that the local government has a lot of debt already. So um, how would they finance the increase of social safety nets and subsidies? And thirdly, if the Chinese government is to encourage um, the migration from rural areas to urban areas by investing in um, agriculture, 
would that not create perverse incentives for people to remain in rural areas? Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, I thank you for your following China's uh, development so closely and uh, ask a good questions. Um, about the uh, uh, hukou, I, uh, that the household registration I mentioned in my presentation, that uh, there's a gradual reform because there are more and more uh, what we call the farmer turned workers living uh, in big cities. I think this will start with the small, medium sized cities first and gradually it will, uh, uh, you know, introduce to the big cities like uh, uh, Beijing, Shanghai. Uh, the aim is to make sure that those, you know, all people living in cities are treated equally. They would have enjoyed equal access uh, to education, to hospital, to public services, and, uh, uh, but you know China is a large country. Uh, we would not expect a quick result, but the, the, uh, the direction, direction has been set. Uh, uh, and on the uh, uh, property above, um, it's, it's a concern. It's still very hot uh, in China. Uh, I just read the uh, uh, the latest uh, uh, figures produced by Chi China National uh, Statistics Bureau. Now, last year, uh, you know, we have this uh, uh, fr uh, first line, s uh, second line, third line cities, uh, big, medium, small. Uh, you know, even small cities are larger than the uh, Birmingham and Manchester. Uh, you know, there are about several hundred uh, cities which have uh, more than uh, uh, several million people. On the big cities like Shanghai, Beijing, Guangdong, uh, uh, this what we call the first line cities, uh, are still are very hot. A government, uh, I, uh, last year it's about uh, almost a two digit uh, uh, increase in terms of the price of the, the, the housing. The government has adopted many measures to cool down uh, the market. A uh, lot, lot of restrictions, for instance you can uh, by uh, the, uh, the, if you are the owner of the first house, uh, you enjoy you know uh, free interest rate loan. If you buy, buy the second house, uh, the you can only enjoy uh, thirty percent of uh, loan with a low interest. Then the seventy percent uh, you have to pay it by yourself, and that's it. You can't buy the third houses, and uh, that's for the uh, the big cities. The uh, the jumbo, the huge cities, I would say. Uh, and for the uh, second line cities, uh, there are some restrictions. And, uh, and also for the, for the uh, uh, medium and small size, there's no restriction. The figure shows that uh, the market is uh, stable, you know, on the, uh, uh, by Chinese term, medium size, you know, uh, second line, like Shenyang, which have uh, 8 million people. You know, uh, almost bigger than uh, London's uh, pro uh, populations, uh, uh, population of London proper. Uh, but that's called the uh, second line cities. Uh, I think the market uh, is relatively stable. Uh, I think I, you, have, you answered the third question. You, you, you've done too much. I think one question for one person. What is your third question? Um, it's just that if you support the rural agricultural farmers as well as encouraging them to migrate to urban areas, would the two objectives not conflict themselves? Uh, no, I think we try to strike a balance in economy. Um, you know, um, because um, uh, the, uh, uh, we, we, we st there's still a demand for a labor force in, in, in rural areas. Uh, and about the, uh, because uh, agriculture become more uh, machin machinalized, and so the few, more and more uh, excess labor force migrate to the cities. Uh, but of course, uh, one idea is, as I said in my presentation, the balance is very important. Uh, so we, what we also, on the one hand, will uh, try to improve uh, the living conditions, working conditions for the migrant workers. On the other hand, we also wish that they will, you know, improve their likelihood uh, in, in, in rural area, in countryside. So government, the, I mentioned about the transfer payment. 
uh, most of the transfer payment went to 40%, even more went to western part of China. And uh, uh, I, I would say uh, 70, 60 to 70 of this 40% are in the countryside, you know, to support the uh, uh, rural areas. You know, in China is a really a large country. Uh, when people talk about China, they used to think about Shanghai, Beijing, Guangdong, and others. Uh, but we have a, a very, uh, if to buy American term, uh, wild, wild west, uh, where I served there for two years, uh, and the conditions are very harsh. Uh, people in many parts in Gansu province, people still struggling with uh, drinking water. The, the, it's a province which uh, have uh, uh, a huge shortage of water. So people do, uh, you know, uh, to catch the rain water, you, they built a cement itself to catch rain water, then purifies it, uh, and then it used as their drinking water, uh, both for human being and the living stock. So uh, it's an enormous, uh, and then the government, you know, um, uh, central government provide fund uh, for them to uh, uh, digging well and uh, building a, you know, a pipeline to get the water from the Ye Yellow River. You know, you, you have to bump the water to 700, 800 meters high. So though uh, uh, Yellow River, what we call it uh, Mother River, runs through Gansu, but many parts of Gansu cannot, you know, sh share enjoy this water because of uh, harsh natural conditions. Thank you. That's on one hand there, there. Thank you so much for coming here, Mr. Ambassador. My name is Bill and I'm from China. Uh, you, in your speech, you have mentioned about the reduction of low wage labor and the increase in the minimum wage. As far as I know, like our growth is relied on export pretty much. But will the increase in wages uh, reduce our competitiveness in the global market? And countries like Vietnam, who actually have the uh, low wage labor as well, may challenge our position of the world factory. Do you think that will lead to the decrease of our export and therefore lead to unemployment? Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's all what we are doing now is to uh, reduce our reliance on export uh, only. Uh, you know, China used to be, uh, in fact, export really uh, uh, play a very important role uh, in China's development uh, uh, in, in the past. But now I think we have entered a stage that we have to shift the model of the growth. You know, uh, China being a second largest e economy, we cannot, you know, uh, depend for export only. So we, China itself is a huge market. Uh, there's a great potential uh, to tap uh, for, for China. So that's why we uh, stress now the innovation, uh, industrial innovation, uh, and to uh, uh, stress the uh, vocational training, uh, we put emphasis on the quality of labor force rather than the quantity of labor force. I think I can't say that we have already put uh, that phase of uh, uh, intense excess uh, labor force, uh, labor intense uh, uh, job behind us, but I think China is really uh, uh, in the transition uh, from uh, uh, reliance on export to uh, uh, a phase of uh, uh, industrial innovation. And uh, uh, even by the, uh, uh, the recent statistics show that uh, uh, con domestic consumption now uh, take up about 50% of China's uh, GDP. Uh, and uh, you know, export used to play a very important part. And also when it comes to the uh, uh, trade, interna uh, China's foreign trade, I think it's uh, more and more getting balanced. Uh, last year, the total trade for China is about 4 trillion US dollars, uh, 4.4, uh, I think. Uh, still, we, have, we enjoy uh, more surplus, but I think it's all more or less getting even now. Uh, almost about 2 trillion for export, 2 trillion for import, 
And um, so I, I, I think um, it, it's, a, it's, a pro, it's quite a, a challenge for China that uh, to increase the wage, that you also increase the cost, uh, uh, you know, for, uh, for your export. Uh, uh, you might weaken your cutting edge of export. And we are faced with uh, very uh, intense competition from uh, other developing countries, our neighboring countries. You mentioned uh, uh, Vietnam. And uh, in fact, uh, I think 20 years ago, if you go uh, Sainsbury, if you go any clothing uh, store, uh, if you buy a, 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 not a cheap, but a cheaper good quality shirt, most of them are made in China. But these days, when you go to uh, uh, Mark Spencer, uh, John Lewis, I think many shirts are no more made in China. They are made in Vietnam, Bangladesh, uh, and hu Hungary, Egypt, and many other, many other countries. So we need to you know, uh, upgrade our industry to another level. So that's why uh, the government uh, stressed uh, the innovation. Uh, so we can make the best use of China's economic uh, strength uh, to further drive China's economy. No, we can no longer depend on export, uh, depend on the market of other countries. We have to you know, uh, tap the potentials of the domestic market, dom domestic consumption. Uh, that will be uh, one of the key areas that China will focus for the next a decade or be and beyond. Thank you. They suggest that you have a, a very busy and, and uh, exciting schedule, so I'm going to have to call a halt to the questions at that point. I'm sure you'll agree with me that Ambassador Liu has laid out um, an inspiring and a challenging agenda for the development of China in future decades, but I'm sure that also that agenda will speak very much to uh, the conference in the rest of the day, for the rest of the day. Um, can you please join me in, in thanking Ambassador Liu.